going to talk you through the um, unit four on the Elizabeth paper, okay, which is Elizabeth's religious problems. And the key question we're looking at here is, did she solve her religious problems or did she not? Did she have success with how she decided she was going to solve them? Okay, because historians have completely different interpretations on that. So first of all, let's have a look at Elizabeth's problems when she first came to power. When Elizabeth came to power, she inherited religious problems. Because remember, her father, Henry VIII, had changed the church from Catholic to Church of England, Protestant, because he wanted to remarry. He wanted to divorce his original wife, Catherine of Aragon, and marry Elizabeth's mother, Anne Boleyn. Um, and then when um, Mary the first, her sister had taken over, Mary the first had reverted the Catholic, sorry, the country back to Catholicism. So when Elizabeth took over England in 1559, she she really had she really had a problem because she had half the country who wanted to retain the Catholic religion as it had been under Mary the first, and then you had half the country who wanted to revert back to Protestantism as it had been under Henry the eighth. Now Elizabeth herself was a Protestant, but she understood the importance of keeping both of these different factions happy. Okay. So another one of her problems was obviously Catholics in England because she was worried if she didn't appease the Catholics, if she didn't satisfy them in some way, um, then she was worried there would be rebellion or civil war and um, she could be overthrown and even killed. So that was a real concern for her. Also, another problem she had was Mary, Queen of Scots, her cousin, the Queen of Scotland. Now, the Queen of Scotland, Mary, Queen of Scots, her cousin, was also heir to the English throne if Elizabeth died. And many Catholics in England actually believed Mary, Queen of Scots, to be the true queen. They believed that Elizabeth had been born out of wedlock because the Pope had never granted the divorce between Henry VIII and his first wife. So therefore, the marriage between um, Elizabeth's mother and Henry VIII was never legal. So they said Catholics believed that Elizabeth had no right to the throne and therefore that Mary Queen of Scots should have been was the rightful true queen, um, the legitimate queen. Another problem she had was Catholic nobles. Actually, a lot of um, a lot of Catholics in England had a lot of power. There was some very powerful nobles in England, such as the um, Duke of Norfolk, who had remember Elizabeth didn't have a full time army. She relied on the nobles' armies in time of war. So these nobles had their own private armies. And she was worried about these Catholic nobles trying to overthrow and to maybe put Mary Queen of Scots on the throne or to install a Catholic queen or king. Um, she also was very worried about invasion from other Catholic countries. France and Spain um, and Scotland at this point were all Catholic countries and they all surrounded England. And France and Spain in particular had a lot of resources, they were very wealthy and they had full-time armies. Elizabeth was very worried that if she didn't choose the Catholic religion, that these powers would invade England and that she wouldn't have the, the resources to fight them off. And the last group of people she was a bit worried about were Puritans. Now, Puritans were Protestants, but they were very, very, very strict Protestants. Now, a lot of Protestants had left England under the reign of Mary I because she was burning them at the stake. She had very strict punishments for them. And um, they went off to um, lots of different places, including Switzerland. Um, and when they when Elizabeth came to power, they thought it was safe to return to England. They thought Elizabeth's Protestant, so therefore it's going to be a safe, safe place to us return to. And we can try and persuade Elizabeth to um, implement a very, very severe Protestant religion. And when Elizabeth came to power, we saw increasing numbers of these Puritans in England and they were growing in power and growing in strength. Um, so this was another group of people alongside moderate Protestants and Catholics that she needed to satisfy. So how did she do it? Well, what she decided to do was come up with a religious settlement. This was her solution to her religious problems. And the religious settlement encompassed two laws. It was the Act of Supremacy and the Act of Uniformity. And it was passed in 1559. Another name that historians call it is the Middle Way or the Via Media, V-I-A. M-E-D-I-A. And the reason they call it the Middle Way is because it was sort of a compromise between the Catholic religion and the Protestant religion. And Elizabeth hoped by having this compromise that she would um, she would satisfy both religions and therefore avoid civil war, avoid rebellion and create unity. Now, the first law, the Act of Supremacy, was about who was going to be head of the church, basically. Uh, now, Catholics believed that the Pope should be head of the church. And Protestants believed the monarch should be head of the church. Puritans believed no one should be head of the church. So what she actually did was she named herself Supreme Governor. 
She didn't call herself head of the church, she named herself Supreme Governor to satisfy Protestants but also to satisfy Catholics who saw the Pope as head of the church. So that was the act of supremacy and she made um, all the clergy swear an oath accepting her as um, the Supreme Governor and if you refuse to swear this oath three times then you could be fined or, or imprisoned, okay? The next law she introduced was the Act of Uniformity. Now, the Act of, it's called the Act of Uniformity because the idea was all of the churches around England, all of the masses had to be uniform, they had to be the same. Okay, and the Act of Uniformity said how mass was going to be delivered. So, again, she tried to please both religions. So, for Catholics, decorations and hymns were allowed and the priest was to wear the vestment still, the robe, the beautiful decorated robe that Catholic priests wear. Whereas for the Protestants, to satisfy them, the Bible was in English, okay, which was um, a massive thing for them because Catholics preferred it in Latin. So the Bible was in English and um, priests could marry. Um, so the Act of Uniformity said how the, the, the Mass was going to be delivered. Now, it also said in the Act of Uniformity, if you refused to go to church, you could be fined. But the fine was only very small. It was one shilling. And it wasn't necessarily strictly enforced. Now, that was for a particular reason. Elizabeth wanted people to accept her church. So she didn't want to punish people too harshly. She'd seen how that had worked out for her sister and her father. It made them extremely unpopular. So this fine for recusancy, recusancy meant not going to church, was very, very small to sort of um, encourage religious tolerance, to show that she she would allow Catholics to still... To still um, she would allow Catholics, not necessarily to be Catholic, but as long as they were adhering to sort of her new church, they could think what they wanted. Um, now, how did she enforce this? Okay, well, like I talked about already, she had the fine for recusancy, but she also introduced something called the visitations. And this was 125 commissioners who went around the country checking that these um, the new law, the Act of Supremacy and the Act of Uniformity were being followed. Um, and the the um, the visitations, 125 commissioners, also ensured that the, the clergy swore the oath accepting Elizabeth as supreme governor. So what was Elizabeth's aims with the religious settlement? Well, one was unity. She was very worried that in case of an invasion, that the country wouldn't be unified. So, for example, if Spain invaded, that the Catholics may rise up against Elizabeth in support of the Spanish. So she wanted unity, okay? She also wanted to avoid a civil war. She didn't want, um, you know... Catholics v Protestants within her own country. So this was one aim of the religious settlement. And the second one was to appease France and Spain. She wasn't necessarily going to have a Catholic church. The religious settlement was Protestant, but she wanted to make sure that foreign powers were happy enough with it that they might let it go. So was it a success? Well, actually, up until Mary, Queen of Scots arrival in England in 1568, there was no real opposition from abroad. The Pope, France and Spain, they did not like the religious settlement because it was Protestant in nature. However, they accepted it until there was an heir in the country. Okay, unity. Actually, she did achieve that on the whole. Most Catholics and Protestants accepted the religious settlement, okay? They were quite happy with it up until she died in 1603, okay? And um, this was seen during the Spanish Armada when Sp Philip really believed that Catholics in England would rise up against Elizabeth when the Armada was coming to England. They didn't. They were quite happy with the religious settlement. They they liked the idea of that kind of compromise. Rebellions, again, similarly to foreign opposition, there were no rebellions, religious rebellions in England until 1569, which was after Mary, Queen of Scots, arrived and there was a, 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 an heir in the country for Catholics. So we can see, again, for over 10 years, most people accepted the religious settlement. However, after 1570, we did see some opposition to the religious settlement, okay? There was the Catholic threat. We saw lots of plots, for example, the Ridolfi plot, the Throckmorton plot, the Babington plot, from nobles, from foreign powers, um, from Mary, Queen of Scots. And we also started to see challenges from Puritans as well who wanted the religious settlement changed because they didn't feel it was um, it was Protestant enough. They didn't like the Catholic elements of it. So we started to see MPs like Anthony Cope challenge her in Parliament. We also saw, saw the separatists led by uh, Robert Brown um, start to challenge Elizabeth. They wanted their own separate church. However, we do have to remember that although there was opposition to this religious settlement, 
it was small, okay, it was minor. The majority of Catholics accepted the religious settlement. I mean, this is seen as well with the oath that the clergy had to um, swear accepting Elizabeth as supreme governor. Only 3% of, um, of these priests refused to sign it. So that's an overview of Elizabeth's religious problems. We're going to have a look at a exam question. And we're actually going to have a look at a question four, which is one that people struggle with a lot. And this is the connections question. Okay, so I'm going to talk you through how I'd approach this connections question before you have a go at answering it yourselves. So I'm going to talk you through question four on page six. And this is, explain the connections between two of the following that are to do with Elizabeth's religious settlement. We have the Act of Supremacy, the Act of Uniformity, Civil War and Foreign Powers. Now where people go wrong with this question is they just pick the two they know most about and they forget that the question is about connections. So what we need to do is we need to think about which two can we connect, okay? And we need to try and think of three connections, okay? Three times connections and we should fully explain these as PEAs, okay? So we should have... Um, so if I'm going to pick now the two that I think I can make three different connections with. I am going to go with the Act of Uniformity. And I am going to go with the Act of Supremacy. Okay, now I want to try and think of three different connections between these three. Now, that doesn't mean that in my answer I can't mention civil war or foreign powers, by the way. In fact, those are clues to things I might want to mention. Okay, so I'm going to connect the Act of Uniformity and the Act of Supremacy. So the first thing I'll do is briefly describe both of them. Now, when I say briefly describe, I mean a sentence on both. Okay. Then my first connection I'm going to say is they both aimed to promote unity. I would then give my evidence explaining how. So for example, um, the act of uniformity pleased both religions, the Bible was in English. And for the act of supremacy, the um, Elizabeth wasn't head of the church. She was supreme governor. Okay. And then in my analysis, I go back to my point. How does that mean they're connected? So I would say, well, they're both, they both promoted unity in this sense because it meant both religions accepted the religious settlement. Okay. So that would be my first point. Okay, and that, that avoided civil war and um, discontent. Okay, now my second point I would write would be that they both appeased foreign powers. Okay, I give my evidence. So again, I might say, well, for the act of uniformity, we saw that the vestment was allowed, but again, the Bible was in English. And then for my analysis, again, I would say, this appeased foreign powers because we didn't see any plots from foreign powers until Mary Queen of Scots arrival. Okay, so there's my second PEA. And then my third, another way they're both connected, would be that um, they both had longevity. Elizabeth never changed them. So I would say they were never changed. 
And that's really significant that Liz has never changed either of them, okay? It shows their success despite the challenges, she never changed them. I would then, for my evidence, talk about how the Puritans challenged her and the um, Catholics challenged her, give lots of evidence, lots of examples. And then for my analysis, I would say, but she never changed them, which shows the success. So again, you might then talk about the fact only 3% of the clergy um, re refused to acknowledge her as Supreme Governor. And then in your conclusion, we want a brief summary of what you've said. So again, how are they connected? And that word connection should be in every single paragraph. Remember, this is not a description of two factors. This is how are they both connected? Now, what I'd like you to do is have a go at this question for. I'd like you to email it to me and then I can send it back to you with some feedback. Okay, thank you very much.